So uh, we're talking about chapter 7 now, 7.1 seven, through 7.5 is what we're going to cover today. Why is that going away? It really bothers me. Okay, so 7.1 to 7.5, and the thing about this stuff is you're going to remember most of this. Okay, of course, we're going to throw something new in there just for fun. Um, not really for fun, necessarily, but um, it's a good place to, to put it. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this is for fun, right? It's just for fun. So, anyway, um, development of the periodic table, effective nuclear charge, sizes of atoms and ions, ionization energy, and electron affinities. doesn't really sound like stuff that you probably remember all of that, right? But, um, but you should remember most of this once we get talking about it. I, I don't know why. I'm, I'm not speaking proper grammar today. So, sorry about that. Was it wasn't. I'm not speaking proper... What, what's going on? I don't know. Um, so, as far as the development of the periodic table, you really don't need to know a lot about the history of the periodic table. This effective nuclear charge stuff, did we talk about that last year at all? I don't remember if we if I called it effective nuclear charge. I don't think I did. Um, see, your book makes it confusing, you know, but it's not confusing. Effective nuclear charge is basically just um, how how much are the electrons being pulled by the protons that are in the center. Okay. Um, the higher the effective nuclear charge, the more energy you would have to apply in order to pull the electrons off. Yeah, you probably do. Sorry. I'm not going to be able to concentrate. <laughs> um, Later. So, that's... <clears throat> Here's the point. Um, you remember that all that PES stuff we were talking about? Photoelectron spectroscopy? And how you hit certain materials with, uh, with certain photons of certain energies and they, uh, they can eject the electrons out of the atom? Um, and the X-ray especially... Um, is really good at doing this with some of the core electrons, and we can measure the energies of those electrons coming out, and we can tell how much energy it took basically to pull them off, okay? So we can measure an electron's, uh, it's called binding energy when you talk about it in the context of photoelectron spectroscopy, um, but we usually call that ionization energy, okay? It's the energy that it takes to essentially strip an electron off of an atom when the atom is in the gas state, okay? So we did talk about ionization energy last year. I know we talked about that. Um, you guys remember talking about ionization energy? It's basically how much energy does it take to pull an electron off of an atom, okay? Um, and so this, this idea of effective nuclear charge is really significant because it really helps you with uh, several different periodic trends. It helps you with atomic size. It helps you with ionization energy. It helps you with electronegativity. Um, all of those things... Um, you can kind of figure out as long as you know the effective nuclear charge, okay? And all you really need to know, the book talks about, uh, talks about it in terms of a number you can calculate. You really don't need to worry about that. What you need to know is conceptually, um, why is it that when we go across the periodic table from sodium, say, number 11, over to argon, number 18, why is it those atoms get smaller? Because it seems like they should get bigger, right? Okay, but they actually get smaller. So you guys remember talking about this last year? All right. The reason, um, it has to do with effective nuclear charge, okay? Because sodium only has 11 protons. Argon has 18. So the more protons you have, well, this is going to be one of those videos where you're just listening to me talk a lot. I'm not really doing much up here. Um, tell you what, I can put a periodic table up here, maybe. That could be helpful. And then I can draw pictures on the periodic table. Let me find one. No, that's not where I want to look. Let's go for the official periodic table. Practice exam we're going to do right before the AP test. Oh, let me open this. Um, Sorry about the dead space here. Oh, there, there it was. Uh, <laughs> and it's sideways, of course. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to turn this either.
Rotate view. There we go. Clockwise. And let's shrink it a little bit. Okay, so now we at least have a periodic table to look at. Although now I'm not able to move it. I don't know why. Okay, there we go. So you've got your periodic table. Um, and the idea that I was, this is just a very bad copy of this periodic table. But the idea that I was talking about here is as we go across um, from left to right, these atoms actually do get smaller. Okay? Um, and the reason for that is because sodium only has 11 protons and argon has 18 protons. Right? Now, 18 protons can pull electrons more closely to itself than 11 protons can. Um, now, there's more electrons to keep track of also, but we're not really adding any new energy levels here, right? So the electrons are still relatively the same distance away from the nucleus in argon as they are in sodium, okay? Or at least that last electron is. Now, again, I, I draw this sometimes, and this is not correct, but it's, it's useful, okay? So in sodium, you've got this one electron that's up here all by itself. It's a one valence electron. In argon, you've got basically the same number of major energy levels, but now you've got eight electrons out here. Okay? So the electrons really aren't any further away from the nucleus, but argon's got a much bigger nucleus that it can attract and pull those protons, or sorry, those electrons in closer to itself. So argon is actually quite a bit smaller than sodium is. You guys remember that from last year? That makes sense. Okay. So that's the atomic size thing. And the effective nuclear charge is basically just talking about what is the charge on the nucleus. Now, there's really two things that you take into account when you talk about effective nuclear charge. One is uh, the charge on the nucleus. And then the other thing that you take into account is how many electrons are shielding the valence electrons from the nucleus. You guys remember talking about that? Okay. So you've got argon. There's the nucleus in the center there. You've got uh, a couple of energy levels of electrons that are sort of blocking those outer electrons uh, from feeling the effects, the full effects of the nucleus. Okay. So the bigger these things get, the further out the valence electrons get, the more electrons you have in between the valence electrons and the nucleus, um, the less tightly they are held by the atom. Okay, and that's why you can actually get xenon to form compounds with stuff, all right? Because xenon, its outer electrons are really far away. Now, noble gases don't normally react with things, right? But um, xenon just can't hold those valence electrons as tightly as helium can. We have yet to make a compound with helium, okay? So that's, that's kind of the idea there. Um, now, if you go down the periodic table, what's going to be the trend for size there? It should get bigger, right? Okay. Because as we go down the periodic table, we're adding energy levels, right? So more energy levels means bigger atoms. Okay. So that that way, it uh, should probably make sense to you. Got it? Yeah. There we go. But the left to right thing is always a little bit tricky. But if you think about that idea of effective nuclear charge, and again, the two things you take into account with effective nuclear charge is how many electrons are shielding the valence electrons from the nucleus, and um, how big is the nucleus, or how many, you know, how many protons are there in the nucleus. Um, so as long as you keep that in mind, you should be able to figure it out. Now, the effective nuclear charge also helps us out with ionization energy. Okay? Ionization energy, we're talking about how much energy does it take to pull an electron off of an atom? So looking again at the sodium through argon uh, row here, which one is going to have, which one of these atoms is going to have the highest ionization energy for its first electron? You think it's sodium? It's either sodium or argon, right? You want to pick one of the ones on the end. So is it easier to pull an electron from sodium or is it easier to pull an electron from argon? should be easier to pull one from sodium, right? In other words, it takes less energy to pull one away from sodium. 
right? So if I'm asking about the highest ionization energy, it's going to be argon. So the valence electrons in argon, uh, they're really not shielded any more than the valence electrons in sodium, right? Because the ones that are doing the shielding are typically the inner electrons, not the ones in that outer energy level. So again, if I, if I draw this, so you've got sodium, right? And here's the electrons on the inside of a sodium atom. And then you've got one electron up here, okay? So it's basically being shielded by... Um, 10 electrons, right? If you look at argon, kind of drew it to scale that time. Okay. Uh, same thing for argon. Each of these outer electrons here um, are being shielded from the nucleus by 10 electrons, just like sodium is. Okay. When you add extra energy levels, then you're going to have extra shielding, right? The extra energy levels? The shielding, yeah, it does. I mean, it's, it's essentially, you know, all of these electrons up here in this outer energy level, they're repelled by anything that's negatively charged, right? Okay, so you've got all these electrons that are a little bit closer to the nucleus. So they're really attracted to the nucleus, but they're kind of repelled by these electrons that are closer to the nucleus, right? So it really weakens the charge. It weakens the force that that, that nucleus has on those outer electrons, okay? So you add another energy level for krypton. Now krypton has, uh, you know, an 18 electrons shielding it, okay? And now that repulsive force is even larger, okay? So then the outer electrons on krypton are held, they're not held as tightly by the nucleus as the one in, ones in argon. Does that make sense? Okay. So we basically just covered both of the ionization energy trends just there. Um, as you go left to right, ionization energy is going to increase. And the main reason for that, again, is because we're not, from sodium to argon, we're not really adding any new energy levels, but we're adding protons, Okay. So argon has a bigger nucleus. It's going to be able to pull those electrons more tightly. It makes it harder for argon to lose an electron. It makes it harder to pull an electron away from argon than it does to pull one away from sodium. Okay? Are you following me there? No? Okay. Less energy, so it would have a lower ionization energy. But again, same trend going down, okay, uh, as, as with size. It, it makes more sense when you're going down. Um, cesium, right here, uh, it has one valence electron, and that one valence electron is really far away from the nucleus, right? And there's a lot of, le of electrons in between that electron and the nucleus. So it's going to be very easy to pull an electron away from cesium. In fact, Almost anything can do it, right? Any other compound that's walking around, or any other element that's walking around, cesium's like, here, take this, you know? And that's why cesium reacts so violently with just about everything, okay? So that's, that's kind of the idea behind ionization energy. Now, electron affinity, I don't remember exactly if the AP exam wants you to know about electron affinity. We talk about ionization energy, ionization energy, effective nuclear charge. Yeah, you know what? Let's not talk about that too much. Um, you can read the electron affinity thing if you want to, um, but I, they're not going to focus on that, I'm pretty sure, on the, on the AP exam. Um, I'll just give you a very quick definition of it. It's basically the exact opposite of ionization energy. So if ionization energy is how much energy does it, does it take to pull an electron away from an atom, Electron affinity is how much energy does an atom give off when you give it an electron, okay? So it's, it's basically just the flip side of ionization energy, okay? Now, electronegativity is something different, and we'll talk about that um, 
in a couple reading guides. I can't remember exactly when we cover that. It'll be soon. Um, so that's, that's kind of the basic idea. Now, the one thing that I do want to show you here, um, oh, you know what? No, I'll do that tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow in class, we'll talk a little bit about the um, essential knowledges and learning objectives, because I think they, they do a good job of really phrasing this in a way that I think makes sense. Um, but that's basically what I wanted you guys to get from today, is just a, a reminder of how the trends kind of work um, and why they work the way that they do. Um, and then the other thing that we will practice tomorrow is looking at some photoelectron spectroscopy data and uh, practicing reading that and seeing how that shows us um, a couple of things. You can either identify an element based on its PES data, or if you know what the element is, you can look at the PES data and you can kind of explain why it makes sense. Okay? So that's, we'll be focusing on, on those two things tomorrow, but um, it all has to do with the, the periodic trends. All right? Okay, I think that's it for today, unless there's any questions about this stuff. Okay. Uh, day classy San Diego, I don't know. I don't know that.